we are taking up uh, verses 19 to 21 of the second chapter of Sri Bhagavad Gita. The underlying principle first. This session is uh, needed neither by Prakriti nor by Atma. Neither of them is in need of any advice, teaching or preaching. Atma is pure non-dual consciousness free of arrival and departure and being free of everything in Prakriti it is free of all sorrow Therefore, the pure self, Atma, needs no healing. Prakriti is a self-sufficient system with no experiencer at all. Therefore, there is nobody there to experience any kind of sorrow. Hence, uh, Prakriti too does not need any teacher or healing or Guru, any sermon, who is to be addressed then? Who is to be healed? It is the fantastic entity called the ego. The ego thinks of itself as something real, therefore it calls itself the truth. Says, I am the self. Hmm? I am real. The thing is, it is just real unto itself. Yes, the ego is real. To whom? To itself. It is the ego that experiences all sorrow because its self-proclaimed reality is contingent on the vicissitudes of Prakriti. Atma is real in a non-dual way. Hence, it does not lean upon anything to ensure its completeness. It is complete within itself without needing any predicates from Prakriti. On the other hand, the Completeness of the ego is always dependent on objects from Prakriti.
एंड प्रकृति एज एक्सपीरियंस्ड बाय द इगो इज अ कॉन्टिन्यूअस सिस्टम ऑफ राइज एंड फॉल एंड चेंज ऑफ फॉर्म The ego does not associate itself with prakriti as a whole. It cannot, because it is little, therefore dualistic. It needs an other to have its own existence. If the ego is associated with or predicated on the entirety of prakriti then there is no other if there is no other the ego cannot exist every small thing necessarily needs an other so the ego attaches itself to some little fragments it perceives in prakriti and as we said everything in prakriti is continuously experiencing a change in form change in form not construction or destruction just change in form but if you are attached to water and the water turns to vapor or ice for you it is not change of form it is death for the element itself it is merely change of form nothing more than that has happened but if you were attached to water specifically for you it means death the water is no more there so you are no more there you are gone from this arises the mighty scare of mankind called death the ego as we said is a fantastic element that arises from prakriti and becomes the soul experiencer of prakriti the soul perceiver of prakriti in that sense you could very logically say that sir it does not arise from prakriti it arises along with prakriti because if the ego is the soul experiencer of prakriti then prakriti cannot exist without ego if the ego alone ratifies the existence of prakriti then ego does not really arise from prakriti it arises along with prakriti and if you say that my answer will be yes the ego arises along with prakriti and this co-origination is to be addressed by the name of prakriti itself for prakriti is not just the insentient objects but also the little consciousness that we call as ego hmm both these together are called as prakriti and if you want to 
differentiate between them shri krishna very beautifully calls one as apara prakrit other as para prakriti the world of inanimate objects as seen by the ego is called apara prakriti and the ego itself the seer of all these inanimate objects the jad jagat is called para prakriti and together these two constitute prakriti so yes uh, you are right if you say that the ego does not arise from prakriti it arises along with prakriti you are you are right hmm? you are right if you are taking prakriti as apara prakriti but when you consider the totality of the term then it is right to say that the ego arises from prakriti are you getting it what is the ego is does it really exist it exists only to itself it exists as long as it is looking at the world in an enarmored way so the answer isn't absolute the answer is contingent on who you are and it's a beautiful question to ask does the ego exist or not it does exist if you are inebriated besotted then it does exist pay attention and it does not so it depends on your state does the ego exist it depends on the state of the ego itself if the ego is attentive it does not exist if the ego is inattentive it exists to whom does it exist only to itself now you understand why the sole method of vedant is atmagyan if all that the ego wants is liberation from itself which means coming to see its own non existence then the only way to see its non existence is by paying attention to itself the more the ego pays attention to itself it sees that it does not exist the more the ego remains attached to this and that all the sensory inputs the ego feels that is real and this is real that is real and this is real what is the definition of reality in vedant in general we call something real if we can perceive it verify it through senses no that is not the definition of reality in vedant that which we call as reality in everyday parlance is just experience or perception in vedant the real is that which cannot be tested by anything because if something can be tested by something it means that thing is dependent on the tester the real therefore is not available to verification the real is that whose existence is not at all contingent on something else you see how do you test something's existence by varying the condition you walk into a room the room is dark how do you test whether or not there is somebody in the room you change the conditions of the room you change the darkness to illumination and immediately you can verify i getting it in vedant the real is that which is not at all dependent on any conditions why is such a definition been given the answer is very practical the answer is hidden in the very genesis of vedant never forget and use that as your guiding rule of thumb if you ever find a conflict with respect to the meaning or interpretation of some verse some sutra the entire purpose is to rid man of his suffering that's why vedant exists and now you must know why reality must not be dependent on anything because if something is dependent on something else that is slavery and that is suffering 
द वेरी पर्पज ऑफ वेदांत इज एमिलेशन ऑफ सफरिंग एंड सफरिंग कम्स फ्रॉम डिपेंडेंसी देर फोर वेदांत went so far as to say that if you are dependent on something then you are not real hence the very definition of reality is that which is free what is real that which is free so as long as you are not liberated are you real and if you are not do you exist because the unreal cannot exist the vedant says only on liberation do you come into existence before that it is just a play of chemicals and processes there is no you really because because the highest respect is reserved for and accorded to the to the word i or you that is the highest vedantic truth i atma itself means i so vedant says you do not deserve to use i if you are not liberated don't say me you are not you become qualified to say that you exist only when you are liberated of your prakritic bondages otherwise you are just bragging i am i am doing that i belong there i am going to do that <laughs> i have such dreams i have such relationships are you getting it please see from where vedant is coming vedant springs from compassion towards mankind itself and those who could see realized that all suffering all our tears it's a very human enterprise please understand hmm it's not just uh, a philosophy for the sake of it something very important is at stake vedant is not philosophy for the sake of philosophy vedant is philosophy for the sake of mankind your liberation is the purpose of vedant not some abstract principle like discovery of truth if you simply say philosophy that simply means you know i like the truth i want to venture into it i love exploring the truth that is philosophy vedant is beyond that the truth is unknowable Hmm? so i'm not going to get into something as abstract as that i want to know how do i wipe off my tears that's the purpose of vedant and with that purpose begins a philosophical pursuit so there is philosophy there is hardcore philosophy there is top notch philosophy but that philosophy is not for its own sake it's a beautiful thing please understand there is a life lesson here hmm something is being done just to help the other the purpose is not to create the highest form of literature that mankind has known no that was not the purpose but something extremely sublime and beautiful sprang from the kind hearted approach to help the other my purpose was to help you and in the process of helping you something extremely beautiful and precious just came up i didn't intend to it spontaneously came up that's what the upanishads are that's what the entire vedantic corpus is it just came the rishis were not fond of proclaiming to the world that they are great authors or philosophers so many times we do not even know where the particular verse is coming from even bhagavad gita we are told ved vyas now ved vyas appears more like a qualification 
more like a title than the specific name of a particular person. Are you getting it? They were not interested in blowing their own trumpet. They wanted to help. The life lesson is, if you do things without the desire for yourself at the center, then what comes from that, what gets created by you, is of an order that you could have never actively imagined. Are you getting it? Hmm? So consider the situation. There is the ego. For us, it does exist, right? So, so let's get rid of uh, the theoretical framework in which the ego does not exist. The ego does exist. Huh? Where does it exist? Here. I am the ego. Let's begin from there. Because that's our experienced day-to-day -day reality. The ego does exist. Right? The ego exists and for the ego is this perceived world. If I am there, then this world is there. There is no dissociation between the two. Have you ever lived for a second in a worldless space? Has that happened? You are there and the universe is not there. Has that happened? So you and the world are necessary companions. True? And the ego is heavily dependent on the world, not only for its sustenance, but for its very identity. Nobody can answer the question, who are you, without picking up something from the world. Try that. Who are you? Answer this question without using anything from the world. Try. Can you? Can you? Try. And then think of the kind of helplessness it is. Who are you? Finished. Finished. Even if you say, I am, you still have used a language from the world. Though that's probably the, the maximum you can liberate yourself from the world. Hmm? Even while giving an answer. Somebody asks you, who are you? And you say, I am. That's the maximum extent of your liberation possible. But even that liberation is so conditional, so limited. So that's the human condition. You live and you live dependently. And that which you are dependent on is a secular self-contained system of its own with no concern at all for your well-being. The cloud does not ask you before raining. Death does not ask you before striking. If you take in some toxin, it does not ask you before hurting you. You thought it was some good sweet meat, went in and started doing all kinds of nasty things. It took your permission. So, I live dependent on you and you are extremely autonomous. You give two hoots to my desires and my concerns. Does it not happen? You go to a river and you put your toe in it. 
for your sake does the water adjust the temperature the temperature will remain what it is if you like it good otherwise is it not so hmm? you are going to miss the flight does the earth start spinning slowly on its axis does that happen and you are dependent on the little thing on your wrist and the little thing on the wrist is not at all concerned about your flight you are telling can can you please please stop yourself for 2 minutes just 2 minutes 2 minutes is all you are missing your flight by such a little thing think and even that is autonomous you cannot do anything that's the human condition you live in an extremely dependent way on the world and the world is independent of you one way traffic you are dependent on the world and the world is independent of you you drop dead right now do the star stars start wailing it does not matter even to the rat or the crow or does it you have just dropped dead and two lizards are mating right over your head that's the worth of your life even as we are busy feeling great in this hall enlightening ourselves a few thousand people have already died in the last few minutes they always do sir that's the natural rate of death nothing shocking about it that's the way the universe is it does not at this moment there is some black hole consuming massive stars think what you call as universe entire universes are being finished this very second our universe is not the absolute universe right this that we look around we call as the universe in that proportion a black hole devours so many universes and you are busy uh, sitting you know somebody is scratching his back and in that interim a black hole finished off some 200 suns 200 suns gone and what were you doing picking your nose or elbowing your neighbor 200 suns finished off without a trace not reduced to ashes reduced to nothingness the universe doesn't care or does it even as we are having this extremely sacred discussion here people are busy killing each other think of the other side of the globe somebody is pestering somebody for a bribe here we are with the sacred bhagavad gita this very moment so many things are happening some judge in some court has been bought off he is delivering a totally unjust verdict is that not happening right now that is happening even as we uttered these words somebody has been shot somebody just succumbed to his chronic illness is that not happening this moment somebody succumbed to his chronic illness somewhere in argentina let's say and we are talking of only the human species if you include all species we can't even imagine what all is going on
even as we spoke so many species went extinct forever they'll never come back somebody is snoring somebody is farting somebody is having sex this very moment think don't think <laughs> who are you nobody with you without you the world gives to hoots this moment if your chair suddenly falls vacant even the cctv will not bother to note you will have to zoom in and see where is the fellow under the chair or where and we we are so pathetically and pathologically dependent on the world what kind of relationship is this this is what deeply hurt the sages they said this relationship is not acceptable you do not care for me whereas i have to live and die by you this won't do this won't do it's like one sided unrequited love even for my very breath i am dependent on you and you don't even notice even if i am gone forever is that not so now there are two ways to approach this situation one way is you know it is not as if nobody cares for me i have two and a half people in my life who do care for me they care for you because you know you have written a will for them a lot of their comforts and security and emotional needs depend on you or physical needs depend on you therefore they care for you they care for you only in this moment 10 years hence their needs will no more be dependent on you then even they will not care for you so one way is to say that it is not as if i am absolutely inconsequential i do matter you see if i am gone 40 people will come to the ceremony those 40 are coming only because you know what hmm you also know that if the conditions change none of those 40 will turn up there is something about the conditions that is making those 40 turn up so one way is the way of self delusion the other way is the way of self liberation in self delusion you remain dependent and want to justify your dependence you want to beautify your dependence you say no this is not dependence this is love i am not a prisoner i have agreed and am cooperating to be in this great mansion that you call as the prison it is not a prison it is a mansion and i am here by my own will i am not held captive here i am just cooperating i am just fulfilling my due responsibilities one way is this then you can say you know i am not in bondage at all so why do i need liberation this is not the way of the sage the rishi by his very definition is the biggest rebel possible rishi is rebellion think of that 
long flowing white beard as his flag hmm he carries that everywhere he goes that is a mark of the rebels i'm not saying everybody who has a beard is a rebel please are you getting a fellow says irrespective of how i carve out my relationships with this thing i will remain a slave a serf a vassal maybe i'll have some autonomy but that will be a conferred autonomy not an earned autonomy not an autonomous autonomy it will be a dependent contingent autonomy somebody like you know you have vassals vassals you understand so there is the king and then there is some kind of the a feudal lord and the king says fine you can control that particular area 40 villages will be under your command so that fellow says right i am the lord of those 40 villages but you are not the absolute lord of those 40 villages the king is over you hmm like you had kingdoms in india even in the british era were they really sovereign the fellow used to call himself the king of such and such state but he was not really the king hmm the kingship was a dependent one the sage is not happy with all that not at all satisfied the sage says i need to have a relationship in which if you cannot depend on me then i too will not depend on you i cannot change your rules obviously this freedom from dependence this freedom from total helplessness is liberation liberation for the ego because i am the ego and i kept remaining dependent i do not want to remain dependent i go into myself and ask why do i remain dependent the answer is because you want something from there why do i want something from there the answer is because i think i lack in that thing why do you think you lack in that thing ah uh, no answer but it just feels that way can we can we explore that can we really verify whether you really lack in something uh, yes seems like a good idea how do we do that ah uh, can we see where the feeling comes from ah uh, nice how do what do we call this process as the answer is self observation since the bondage stems from me therefore i have to go into myself to find the root of the bondage and uproot it otherwise it is very indignified do you see the indignity think of being in relationship with someone and you do not matter at all to that person whereas money for money you depend on that person for food you depend on that person for identity you depend on that person for house you depend on that person for clothes you depend on that person for emotional support you depend on that person for physical support you depend on that person you would enjoy this condition would you ah uh, that's the condition of mankind by birth that's how we are condemned to be born extremely vulnerable and totally dependent and in this dependency is indignity therefore vedant is a rebellion to reclaim dignity give it back to me what my dignity thank you now now it will probably be easier to understand 
why Shri Krishna speaks this way. Those who think of the Atma to be the slayer and he who takes it to be the slain, neither of these knows. It does not slay nor is it slain. Hmm? It is an instruction into the very nature of the pure self. Rising, falling, change of forms, arrival, departure, all these belong to the field of Prakriti. Stay away. All that is happening there, all that is not happening here, all that is happening, all that must not happen to you. All that is happening, Parth, it is not necessarily happening to you. To whom is it happening? It is happening to the perceiver. I am not the perceiver. Who is the perceiver? The eyes are the perceiver, the body is the perceiver. To some extent, even the mind, body, mind, intellect and memory are the perceivers. And yet, I can stand apart from all these. So, all this is happening. Is that happening? Is it happening? All happening is to someone. To whom is the happening? To I, to the eyes, it, the happening is there. To the skin, the happening is there. To the memory, the happening is there. Freedom lies in being able to see the other eye and call your normal eye as the other one. The ego is there and things are happening to the ego. Obviously, the ego is experiencing pain. Is the pain there? Yes, the pain is there. To the? Not to me. There are two eyes now. There are two eyes. It is very strange. In non-duality, there are two eyes. <laughs> and in duality, there is only one eye. <laughs> in duality, there is only one eye called the ego. Called the ego. Does the ego experience anything called the other eye, the true self? No. So, in duality, there is only one eye called the ego. In non-duality, the other one just opens up and this other one becomes the first one, the real one. Let us simply say the only one. Because the only one, therefore non-duality. Only one, why? Because that's who I am. That's who I am. Then what is that one that is experiencing the pain? That is a product of the body. That is not who I am. Therefore, non-duality. Then when there is a single eye, why do you call that duality? Because there are two for that single eye. Me and the world. Therefore, it is dualistic. In that single eye framework, there is the eye called the ego and there is the world. So, there are two. Hence, it is dualistic. But when there is, there are those two eyes, then what is real? Only the eye. The other two are playing with each other. The world and the ego, they are playing with each other. And both of them are just play things to each other. Let them do whatever they want to do. Hmm? Minus is contained only in the pure self. Therefore, non-duality. Why is Krishna telling Arjun that the pure self can neither be killed nor does it kill? Those who think of killing with respect to the pure self are deluded. Why is he saying all this? So that the fear that the highest lies in the body itself can be removed. Please 
Consider Arjun's situation. He is supposed to fight and fighting would involve killing the body. Arjun is taking this killing as so important, so significant that he is trembling from this perceived significance. When something absolutely significant is happening to you, don't you tremble? That significance could be good, bad, desirable, undesirable, whatever. But if something totally significant is happening, absolutely, something of the highest significance is happening. Have you seen your condition? Huh? You tremble. You, you feel small because something so big is happening. And in front of that bigness, you are little. Sri Krishna is trying to tell Arjun that the reality is anyway very distinct from this drama that is being played out here. Why are you attaching so much significance to it? You will shoot, they will fire, all that is okay. None of that has any bearing on reality. Somebody will get killed, somebody will kill. None of that has any bearing on the reality. Hence he is saying, Atma can neither be killed nor does it kill. Which means that all this killing that will happen here has nothing to do with the absolute truth. Hence you need not give an absolute weightage to these happenings. It is because you are giving an absolute importance to this happening that you are nervous. Hmm? And Trembling. Do you understand? There is a lot of psychology here. You think this is very important? No, it is not. The thing of real importance is something else. So how should we conduct ourselves here then? If the real thing is there, how should we conduct ourselves here? The answer is wonderful. The answer is, you should conduct yourselves here in a way that helps you and others realize that this is not the real thing. Because the real thing is there. But you suffer because you think that the real thing is? Hmm. What should be then the purpose of all your actions here? To help yourself and the others see that this is not real. And if there is somebody who is hell-bent on proving, establishing that this is the absolute, this, the dualistic drama is the absolute thing. Then dharma requires that such a person be stopped in his tracks. What is the purpose of life? To help yourself and the others see that all this is not Absolute. Which means you need not have greed and lust and avarice and temptation. Right? Because if all this is not very real, what are you drooling for? Do you get this? Therefore, Arjun, this war needs to be fought. Because that fellow on the other side, if he becomes the king, he will establish to the entire country that all this is so significant that you can resort to all kinds of dubious means just to gain a piece of land. Duryodhan's ascension to the throne would establish to the entire population that the throne and the land and the power and the pelf are so valuable, so absolutely valuable that anything can be done for their sake. And if that is established, that would mean sorrow for the entire nation. Because what is sorrow? Considering Prakriti as real is sorrow. And that is what Duryodhan is out to establish to the entire land. That Prakriti is real. Prakriti is so real that I can kill my own brothers for it. Through conspiracy. Therefore, fight. Fight. 
if you are killed that is okay who says you are alive anyway if they are killed that too is okay the real thing is somewhere else arjun will be very justified in asking if the real thing is somewhere else why do we fight at all let me just go and sleep somewhere anyway the absolute lies neither in fighting nor in sleeping so let me simply go and sleep somewhere yes you can do that but that would mean that sorrow would continue and the purpose of the sage as we have repeatedly seen today is the elimination of sorrow duryodhan on the throne would mean sorrow to the kingdom fight not for the throne path fight for dharma the throne is incidental you can have the throne and then relinquish it if you want to getting it verse 19 is to take the seriousness away from arjun's shivering arjun is so damn serious about what is going on after all the society is absolute after all the blood relations are absolute how do i shoot at my own kith and kin and that very respectable and affectionate pitama because those things are absolute that's what the family and uh, the society teach us no this is the highest absolute means that beyond comparison unconditionally highest that's what we call it so that's what the society has told us that these things are the highest the memories the attachments the sanskars that's what been touted as the highest and arjun therefore is very serious am i being told to violate the highest will i kill my own brothers krishna is taking the seriousness out of arjun's condition and arjun's arguments what lies at the core of arjun's arguments all this is very important krishna is saying the important one is there this is just drama do you understand how how it's operating the important one is there this is drama now tell me what are you shaking and shivering for then arjun should say if this is just drama then let me run away because it's very much possible that in drama a particular character just runs away and then krishna would say if you run away then this would be a very melancholy drama then this would be a drama full of lot of suffering therefore fight knowing fully well that this is a drama fight getting it the same flow continues in the next two verses the real is uh, never born nor does it die it is not that you could uh, read it as it is not that which you think of or assume not having been it again comes to being it is unborn eternal changeless ever itself the body might be killed that has no impact on the truth getting it then 21 he who knows the self the truth to be indestructible changeless birthless immutable how is he arjun to kill someone or cause a killing because the word killing can apply only to something that is alive the alive one is there all this is just drama so there is no killing happening here 
इट्स ऑलमोस्ट लाइक अ रामलीला मंच लॉट्स ऑफ बॉडीज विल फॉल बट नो बडी विल गेट किल्ड अर्जुन प्ले और पार्ट नो किलिंग कैन हैपन For something to be killed, it should first of all have ever been alive. Now, life is possible only to that. And if someone is so liberated as to have become that, then he is anyway liberated of the body. So even if you kill his body, he is not killed. Those who are not liberated, they are anyway not alive. Please understand the argument. Those who are not liberated, they are anyway not alive. They are a moving bunch of processes and chemicals like a machine. So the word killing does not apply to them. Hmm? I have been sipping tea. Have I killed it? You take a big lump of salt and you. bludgeon it with a hammer have you killed it why not it's reduced to particles now have you killed it no killing does not apply to those with chemical consciousness so they cannot be killed and if someone who is not chemical anymore who is liberated now then that fellow anyway does not identify with the body even if the body falls he is not killed so either way killing cannot happen So what are you then so shaky and nervous for? Just deliver your dialogues, perform your role, and get out. Get out as soon as possible. That's what we are all here for. No. Do you do you understand his argument, Krishna's argument? It's a beautiful argument. anything that is happening in the field of prakriti is unreal correct unreal but to the ego it is very very real so you must realize first of all that anything that you do in the field of prakriti has no absolute significance at all the entire world may disappear tomorrow it makes no difference to the atmagyani some big rock comes and strikes the earth the entire planet is gone makes no difference to the self knower it's very strange this one appears like a heartless person no he is extremely compassionate but the thing is it does not matter to him because he knows all this is just entire universes keep rising and falling how does it matter the entire play of prakriti is just to me if i say oh it's an eternal and uh, vast infinite universe all that is just my saying otherwise it is just my field of perception my field of perception only as big as i am there is no point calling it the colossal infinite universe it does not matter to the liberated one are you getting but the liberated one also knows that once he was not liberated he also knows that all those who are not liberated today have the potential to move to his own place therefore knowing fully well that the drama does not matter he still participates in it he participates in it in a way that pulls people out of the drama and that's how shri krishna is asking arjun to fight the war yes it is a drama arjun first of all you understand that secondly don't allow those forces to win who will continue this drama of sorrow 
because the liberated one he does not feel any sorrow those who are in the drama they are feeling all the sorrow therefore the drama must be conducted very meticulously you cannot just dismiss the world and saying oh all this is maya you might be liberated or relatively liberated so you are saying all this is maya but think of the one who is caught in maya he is the experiencer of sorrow and the entire vedantic stream begins as a rebellion against sorrow therefore you cannot say oh even sorrow is unreal no 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 sorry that argument will not be bought sorrow is unreal to the one who is free of sorrow the one who is experiencing sorrow he has to be helped that is at the core of all that shri krishna preaches to arjun two grown ups are rehearsing a particular scene in a play in front of a kid and that particular scene involves aggressive violent exchange of abuses and also blows physical blows they are rehearsing let's say at some prime in the night and the kid is still awake and the kid is watching them and the kid is watching them and these two are rehearsing and to the kid the drama is real and the kid gets terrified the kid gets terrified so what will the grown ups do they'll say right let's rehearse some other scene right now some other more amicable more pleasant scene more agreeable scene and so they switch the scene now in this scene that is being watched by the kid these two grown ups are hugging each other and exchanging pleasantries instead of blows talking nice things and saying yes sir would you want to have some tea was it not a drama then is it not a drama now but the drama has to be conducted very meticulously keeping in mind the interests of the kid it is still a drama it was even then a drama not that the drama is being taken as real krishna is not telling arjun take the drama as real he is not saying oh the war is extremely important no he is not saying the war is extremely important look at the genius of shri krishna he is saying the war is not at all important now fight <laughs> this is so different from motivation in motivation we tell someone this is more important than your life plunge into it give everything to it die for it because it is so very important on the contrary shri krishna is saying arjun fight the war because it is not important know that it is not important at all and then fight as if your life depends on it know that this is just a drama this is just a drama the real thing is atma nahanne te hanne mane sharir the bodies will fall atma remains untouched know that this is a drama and then perform your role to perfection why should i perform my role to perfection the answer is compassion for the sake of the little kid who still does not know that this is a drama for the kid the drama is real so what is the aim of the drama to bring the kid to a point where he starts seeing that all this is a drama that is exactly the role even shri krishna is playing in the drama he is trying to bring kid arjun to a point where arjun sees that all this is a drama yet it has to be played mm -hmm.